Um, she uh, works at Bill Billings Clinic. Uh, she did her uh, undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Montana. And then she did a senior internship in at St. James, Ho James Hospital in Butte. Um, she, she did her uh, medical school at Des Moines uh, College of Podiatry in um, Iowa. And then she also did her residency at the VA Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. Um, welcome and thanks. And I must say that I've heard um, lots of comments from our residents who have rotated with you that it's been a very uh, worthwhile rotation and they have learned immense amount of care. So thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is probably one of the two favorite months that I have out of the year. There's an awareness month for everything. In case you didn't know, limb loss awareness month is April and then peripheral arterial disease awareness month is in September. So we kind of twice a year um, talk about what is my passion and the reason I became a podiatrist instead of an MD or a DO, which is um, I think too many people lose legs um, and where possible, I wanted to be a part of the team that helps prevent that from happening. Um, so this lecture is kind of part of our campaign for lack of a better word, but also a good educational experience because you guys are as much a part of that team um, as I am. And in some ways you guys are a more important part of that team than I am because I have the great pleasure of doing the fun surgical part. You guys have the really difficult part, which is managing all these people's comorbidities, which um, if you've been on service at Billings Clinic anytime in the last six weeks, you know is a lot of patients with a lot of problems because we've been sharing an awful lot of patients the last couple times I've been on call at least. Um, so I don't have any disclosures um, of any importance other than that this is a hard topic to cover in less than an hour. Um, in large part because it's so wide and encompassing. Um, and in part because I get really excited about it and that makes it hard to keep it brief. <clears throat> so our objectives today are to understand the goals of limb salvage, um, recognize patients who are at risk of amputation, um, and to appropriately, appropriately refer to the right provider at the right time. Because this isn't just about, did I get them to the right provider? It's, did I do it in a timely fashion so that we made a difference? Because sometimes with these patients, the difference in a week can make the difference between I lose a toe and I lose my leg if they're not appropriately triaged for intervention. Um, so I always start with like the perfunctory statistics um, one in 190 Americans currently live with limb loss. Um, and if we don't do anything about that in the way that we treat, treat patients and the way that patients start taking care of themselves, um, it's anticipated that that number is going to double by 2050. Um, that means that one person of the population or a little over one person of the population will be living with limb loss. Um, and then the other thing I like to tell people, because I hear a lot like, Dr. Sample, this is an exercise in futility. This patient is going to lose their leg anyway. Why are we spending all of this money and all of these resources to save this toe on this person who's got a hemoglobin A1C of 16 and they won't stop smoking and all of those things? But it's not just about like patient quality of life. It's actually because it saves the overall system a lot of money. The average cost of an amputation for a single patient is $70,000, just a little bit over that. Um, and that number is from 2016, so it's anticipated that that is now higher. But the other thing is that for these patients, it doubles the amount of money it costs to take care of them after a major amputation, like a below the knee or an above the knee amputation. Um, and they no longer contribute to the system. So um, it often means that if they weren't already on disability or retired, it forces them into early disability or retirement. Um, it can significantly change their ability to stay at home. A lot of those people end up living in a facility after that. Um, and so these are it's it's high stakes for the system as a whole and not just for the individual patient that we're treating. Um, I always put these slides in here. You guys can review them. It talks about how many patients have diabetes, how many of these are undiagnosed, 
One in four people over the age of 65 are diabetics. We anticipate this will continue to be worse, and it costs us as a system $327 billion a year to take care of people with diabetes alone. Um, so if you ever need those. When we talk about diabetic ulcer incidence, 5% of all diabetics will develop an ulcer in their lifetime. 1% of those lead to an amputation, and that means anything from I lose the tip of my toe to I lose my whole leg. Um, this is one of my favorite studies, and if any of you rotate with me, you may have heard me tell patients about this study. This shows that the five-year mortality after a new onset ulcer is 50% if it's a diabetic foot ulcer. If you end up with an amputation, that five-year mortality rate makes it 75%. Um, it's not because having an amputation kills you. It's because the wound or the peripheral arterial disease that caused you to lose your limb is severe enough that you have end organ damage. So the same things that cause them to get an ulcer are damaging their arteries and their hearts, their brains, their kidneys. Um, the neuropathy is starting to cause brain atrophy. Um, they're getting kidney disease, like all of the bad fallout we see from diabetes. So this is more a marker that things aren't going well than it is a losing your toe kills you situation. But what I also tell my patients about this is this is their wake up call to be in the 50% that make it and not the 50% that don't. Um, so causes of limb loss, I remind people that it's not just diabetes. Um, trauma is the leading cause of limb loss in people under the age of 30. It's much more common in men than women um, for all of the reasons that trauma is more common in men than women. Um, it can be a definitive solution to deformity that isn't amenable to reconstruction, um, which may be co acquired or congenital. It can be caused by peripheral arterial disease or critical limb ischemia. It can be caused by cancer and it can be caused by infection. So some of like all of these, with the exception of cancer, are considered preventable causes of amputation and depending on the cancer, could be preventable or not preventable, depending on whether it was missed early or what have you. Uh, but those are the main causes that people lose a limb. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, I skip over trauma, deformity, and cancer. Um, I'm not a trauma surgeon. I'll never pretend to be one. Um, deformities that are congenital and acquired that lead to amputation is a completely different lecture and for most of y'all is going to be a you have a really weird looking foot or leg i'm sending you to a specialist and sign off and bless them and then i am not a cancer doc and i don't pretend to be if i do identify a cancer in my clinic other than a basic skin cancer all of those get referred um, to a musculoskeletal oncologist which is standard of care um, and i encourage you all to do the same um, so when we talk about the goal of limb salvage, um, good limb salvage is not about saving as much as you can. The goal of limb salvage is to leave patients with a functional limb based on their current function and their anticipated future function. So this is one of the conversations that I have a lot with patients and you guys may see me have with patients in the hospital. Good example, if you have a really, really severe infection, but you are a paraplegic, yes, I can take you, I can do an extensive IND. If you don't have good blood flow, we can certainly revascularize you. It's not gonna stay open because you're not walking, which is a requirement to keep those kinds of things running. Um, and a lot of the time, the recommendation will be an above the knee amputation because they develop a horrific contracture that causes new pressure wounds. Conversely, you may have a 90 year old patient who has a horrific forefoot wound and in a younger person, we would recommend a BKA, but in this patient would mean no longer living at home. So we recommend something like a show parts amputation where I leave their talus and their calcaneus, which is not super functional for most young people, but for somebody who's 90 and just needs something to transfer on is a good gamble. So there's lots of factors beyond just, is my blood flow adequate and is my infection adequately controlled that go into doing a good job at limb salvage. And some people who do limb salvage are stopping using the term limb salvage completely because it 
picture creates this picture of I saved as much as I could, regardless of whether or not it's a functional saved as much as I could. And they prefer like functional limb preservation, which I just think is a mouthful and patients glaze over when you get to functional. So um, specialties that are involved in limb salvage. Um, does anybody want to tell me what specialties they think are involved in limb salvage? I'm all about interaction. Vascular, good. Wound care. Yes, absolutely. Who else? Folks, feel free to come off a mute or put it in the chat. Please. Infectious disease. Yes. <laughs> Hyperbarics. Absolutely. Anybody else want to make some guesses? What is the specialty most of the residents are going to be doing? We thinking we're going to be families practice docs for the rest of our life because they're still part of the team. Yeah, exactly. So this is not an all inclusive list. I'm not going to pretend like it is, but the team includes family practice, internal medicine, th therapies and nursing. Absolutely. Podiatry, wound care, vascular. I would be remiss if I did not talk about my good friends in orthopedics. Um, at St. Vincent's, you guys don't even have podiatrists to manage your inpatients, so orthos who you call when there's pus in that foot. Um, infectious disease, physical medicine and rehabilitation is a really important specialty that we work with some. Endocrinology to manage that horrible diabetes. Um, physical and occupational therapy, nursing, hyperbarics um, is part of wound care at Billings Clinic, so I included that in there. But all of these specialties, if you take care of a patient who's got diabetes, you're part of the team is what it boils down to. Um, so when we talk about limb salvage for diabetics and peripheral arterial disease, um, the most important thing is preventing the wound in the first place and preventing the patient from losing their leg. It's always sad to me when I see somebody and they've been treated someplace um, and they had access to vascular doctors where they were. They had access to podiatrists and wound care specialists. And for whatever reason, that patient never got referred, didn't have any workup, and then they show up in the hospital and it's an I'm losing all my toes situation when it was preventable if we got on top of it early. Um, so there's a three minute diabetic foot exam that's in here. That is a tool that was developed by podiatrists for any provider to evaluate a diabetic foot for a risk of developing a diabetic ulceration or critical limb ischemia. Um, this is not mine. This actually comes from the Amputation Prevention Centers of America, um, which is a kind of a tertiary care center that, if I remember correctly, is like in Arizona. Um, and they um, do nationwide education on limb salvage and amputation prevention. Um, and it talks about the fact that a diabetic foot exam does not take forever. Um, it takes about three minutes. Um, the questions you have to ask the patient, uh, what you know, essentially you're asking the things that tell you, do you have claudication, which is a sign of critical limb ischemia? Do you have diabetes? Do you have neuropathy? And do you have something going on right now? Um, this is part of like that NIPS thing, I think that you guys have to do in the internal medicine and family practice world. So you should already be doing these things. But the nice thing about this is it gives you a good risk guideline on when and how urgently you should refer somebody and also um, what an appropriate referral window is. So this is a really helpful way um, for you guys to figure out how soon do I need to get somebody in to see somebody. However, I always give the caveat. This is designed for providers that have unlimited access to resources of specialists. It's going to take you longer if your patient's in Poplar to get them to Billings for a problem. And depending on the patient, they may say, I'm not coming next week. So 
always with the asterisk that the world is a little bit different when we're practicing rural medicine like we do here in Montana. So um, one of the questions I get a lot from my patients is why do people with diabetes lose their feet? It's this combination of neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, which includes both venous and arterial diseases. Their tissue glycosylates, so it's no longer flexible the way it's supposed to be, making it more prone to breakdown. They get chronic inflammation, which keeps wounds from healing when they do develop them, whether they're a traditional neuropathic ulceration or a I stepped on a nail situation. Um, when your blood sugars are poorly controlled, your white blood cells no longer function properly. I tell my patients that when your blood sugar is above 250 on average, that your white blood cells are so gummed up with sugar, they can't go find bacteria anymore. They're sugar drunk. Um, and then deformity. So the neuropathy, the arterial disease, the tissue glycosylation causes tendon contractures. It causes um, instability and they get deformities that mean they have pressure points that shouldn't be there and it makes them more prone to developing ulceration. Um, you guys all know this workup stuff. You guys do a pretty decent job of getting x-rays, ABIs, MRIs, these types of things. It's really nice if you're sending a referral for wound care if the patient already comes with these things at least ordered, um, if not already done. Um, one thing I remember, like to remind people is we have several different types of wounds and sometimes they're mixed. So arterial wounds, venous wounds, neuropathic wounds, and pressure wounds are probably the four that we think about the most when we think about chronic wounds that are failing to heal. Um, but they're not the only things that cause wounds or cause limb loss. So radiation um, can cause skin breakdown. So you may see this in somebody who had a melanoma excised and they weren't sure the margin was clear and they had something radiated. Um, if anybody ever spent some time hanging out in the VA, radiation was used for a brief period to try to treat um, jungle rot. And these guys, despite the fact their radiation exposure was decades ago, will get breakdown similar to what women who've had radiation of breast tissue will get if they have shoe gear rubbing. And so you might see wounds that are caused by that. Um, surgical wounds, like a wound that dehisses after surgery, uh, malignancies can present as a non-healing wound. Um, autoimmune diseases can cause a wound that is just not healing. Um, pyoderma gangrenosum is one that we see every now and then at the wound care center and is kind of like the quintessential autoimmune ulcer. Um, chemical burns can cause that. Um, and then they can be secondary wounds. So those are the things like trauma and that kind of thing that cause that kind of breakdown. Um, once there is a wound, we have lots of tools in our toolbox. Um, some of these are things that we do at the wound care center. Some of these are things that if you're practicing remotely, you can do in your office. Some of them are things that you can do where you are at Riverstone. Um, one of the things that I tell anybody who's in internal medicine or family practice is if you're treating a wound and it's not getting in a better in a month, from a medical malpractice perspective, you should always seek a second opinion if it's not doing anything in a month. Whether that second opinion is a pathology specimen that you take and you biopsy it yourself, whether it's you send it to a wound care center to have a look at it, whether it's you know it's a venous wound, so you send them to go see a vascular team or you know it's an arterial wound, you should be sending it to vascular either way. Like you always want to spread the risk when you're talking about something as serious as someone losing a leg or a toe even. So never a bad idea to get a referral, spread the risk and do those things. Um, so the four things that I tell everybody when they rotate with me that you need to heal is you need to get the pressure off, you need to manage bacterial load, nutrition and oxygen. These four things for every wound need to be managed regardless of etiology. Um, and we do that lots of different ways. <clears throat> so pressure can be managed with lots of different offloading devices when we talk about the lower extremity. Um, this is a crest pad, donut pads. This is a, called a dancer's pad. Um, you can use little inserts that you can offload wounds in their shoes. 
Um, you can make them non weight bearing and put them on crutches or a rolling knee scooter. Um, a walking boot can take the pressure off of something. Um, this is called a crow walker. It's what most patients with Charcot end up in um, as their definitive shoe gear. And then total contact casting, which is the gold standard. Um, and these are all like important parts of our toolbox. And depending on how remotely you choose to practice when you leave residency, um, <clears throat> or depending on where you practice now, some of these are things that are relatively cheap easy to keep in your office and make a world of difference. Um, the donut pads are my personal favorite for offloading any sort of wound. I also use them when I um, treat like a planter's wart or something because we'll get some blistering from the cantheridin that I put over it um, and it helps a lot with comfort. And these are really, really cheap. Like we're talking, you can get a hundred pack for less than $30. So not something that's gonna break the bank to get these and patients can buy them themselves online pretty readily available over the counter. So like pressure relief doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming is the take home on this. Um, total contact casting is the gold standard for neuropathic ulcers. It's contraindicated for arterial wounds. Um, it can be helpful in pressure ulcers, depending on where they are. Um, if you find yourself doing an awful lot of wound care in your future, um, I highly recommend coming and spending a rotation with us if you have the ability to, whether you're an attending coming and hanging out with us for a couple of days, or if you're a resident coming and hanging out with us for a couple of weeks. Um, and we do these a fair bit in the office. This is called a soft total contact cast. Um, there's lots of reasons to use this instead of a total contact cast in the right patient. Um, I'm not going to go through the details about how to do it. There is a link to the video for how to do this. Um, and it's made with things that most people have available in their hospital. It's literally gauze, cast padding, and an Una boot and Coban, which if your hospital does not have those things, um, you're probably practicing in a third world country because they even have these things in like the very tiny critical access hospitals all over the state. Um, this would be a traditional diabetic foot ulcer presentation. This guy was in a total contact cast off and on for a really, really long time and he got better and it was fantastic. But every time you took him out of the total contact cast, he'd re break down. This would be an example, even if you're having success with doing your own wound care, that it's time to consider a surgical consult, not an emergent one, but a relatively urgent one, because all I did for this guy was lengthen his Achilles tendon with three small stab incisions. You can see in the picture on the left, his foot doesn't lay flat on the floor, right? His foot's really tilted, and that's where he kept breaking down. So by lengthening his Achilles tendon, I not only took the pressure off the forefoot, but re-straightened his foot. And he remained wound free for a really long time after we did this. Um, so sometimes you just really need to put in the surgical referral, even if you're successful at getting someone healed, because sometimes the, the battle isn't getting a wound to heal. Sometimes the battle is keeping it healed when people go back to their daily day life. <clears throat> Again, prevention, best medicine here. Um, bio burden management. Um, we do this lots of different ways. Um, so you can do biological debridement. Um, that a good example of biological debridement would be um, maggots. So sometimes patients bring their own biological debridement with them. Um, enzymatic. So. Uh, the enzymatic debrider that's on the market would be Santal or collagenase, if you've ever prescribed that. Um, autolytic debridement, so autolytic debriders would be like TheraHoney, which is really, really cheap. Um, Pluragel, um, those kinds of things that kind of cause the hard eschgar, the nasty fibrotic stuff to break down um, more quickly than they would do it on their own. Um, there's mechanical debridement, so that would be um, taking like gauze or <clears throat> the oral mouth swabs that they have in the hospital, not the ones that are lemon flavored, but the unflavored ones you give to NPO patients complaining of dry mouth. Um, those are fantastic for cleaning up some debris off of a wound on somebody who's pretty painful. 
Um, and just would be what we would consider non-surgical debridement. And then we have surgical debridement. And that doesn't necessarily mean done by a surgeon in an operating room. Sometimes surgical debridement means that you just take a scalpel or a curette to an ulcer in your office. And that counts as a surgical debridement. And all of those things help get rid of that biofilm that grows on top of the wound. <clears throat> So this is a good example of what a difference debridement makes. So this guy on the left had been so painful, he refused to let anybody debride him. So I numbed him up with a little local anesthetic in the office, and we went from this picture on the left to this picture on the right in a week. And the only thing that we really did was finally clean the bio burden off of it so that it could heal. It's amazing how much of a difference that makes. So. One of the things that I see a fair bit referred to me from the community are patients that nobody feels comfortable debriding a wound or they don't have anybody who's trained to do it. And they'll send us venous stasis ulcers that they have compressed for months and never made any progress. And the wound is just full of slough and bio burden. And that's never gonna heal even though you're compressing that patient until their legs are blue. Um, if no, if you guys haven't read the infection, infectious disease um, guidelines from 2012 for diabetic foot ulcers and infection management, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a really great document that has like things that you should be looking for, appropriate imaging, appropriate antibiotics. Um, one of the things that I see a lot from like rural communities is they follow the IDSA guideline for purulent versus non purulent cellulitis when they have somebody with a diabetic foot wound specifically, and that is an adequate antibiotic coverage. And then they'll call me and it'll be three or four days later and they'll say this person is getting worse. They're really, really sick and I've had them on ANSEF for a week and it's like that's not going to cover the majority of what causes diabetic foot ulcers. It's inadequate management. Um, it also talks about, you know, routine antibiotics. I get this question from patients a lot. Um, it's a lot of education similar to ear infections for you guys, um, which is not every hole in foot requires antibiotic. If it's not infected, don't give them an antibiotic. Hold on just a second. I'm going to see if I can get them to turn that vacuum cleaner off. So last week it was technology of buzzing sound, and this week it's a vacuum. Sorry about that. They apparently had a sink overflow, and so they're trying to do water mitigation while I'm lecturing, and the door's just not cutting it. Um, let me see here. Oxygen is the other thing that you need wounds to heal. So patient factors, when we talk about oxygenation of tissue, um, there's a lot of things that aren't things that I necessarily manage. There are things that you guys in internal medicine and family practice manage a whole lot more than I do. Um, smoking, I talk to all my patients about smoking cessation until I'm blue in the face. Um, COPD, if their COPD isn't well controlled, they're not perfusing their tissue. Um, same thing with heart failure. Um, if patients are on oxygen and choose not to use it, if they're walking around with a toe wound that's never going to heal because their little toe doesn't get enough blood flow and enough oxygen carrying blood flow to make a difference. Um, their ejection fraction matters, not just because, you know, they don't oxygen it as well, but also because a lot of them have a little bit of arterial disease and their heart can't push enough blood past that blockage to get better. So sometimes I'll see somebody who has a TAVR procedure done, their injection fraction gets significantly better, and suddenly I'm making headway on this wound, which is awesome when it happens. Um, sleep apnea, so if patients aren't using their BiPAP or their CPAP at night, their wound may never heal because they're spending this long period of time unperfused appropriately. And then peripheral arterial disease, like if you have a big old blockage in your superficial femoral artery, um, Nothing I do is going to make any difference. Um, 
So this is a really good example of this. The top left picture is a guy who came in to see me. He was a referral from an outside hospital for pain in toes. They thought that his toe pain was related to the hammer toes that he had. And no one looked in between his toes where he had these ash scars where every toe touched. So I walked across the hall. I grabbed one of our vascular surgeons, had them take a look at it. They took him, they um, removed a whole bunch of plaque out of his superficial femoral artery. His wounds healed in four weeks. This is a halfway point two weeks, and this is like the day I discharged him with a very pinpoint wound that finished closing in the next couple of days. Um, and, you know, it's just a good example of like a lot of the time I didn't do anything. I treated these once he was revascularized with betadine and just let the tops fall off as it healed up underneath and underneath they're healed. Um, so sometimes like less is more depending on what you're dealing with. Um, so hyperbaric oxygen therapy is another way to help overcome all of those patient factors. Um, this is one of the studies that I re reference a lot. And what they looked at was if they took patients and they had osteomyelitis, a wound, peripheral arterial disease that had been treated to its maximum benefit, and then half of them did hyperbarics, half of them did not, the healing rate was significantly higher in patients who did hyperbarics than patients who didn't. And the amputation rate, which is the thing that really matters, was significantly lower in the hyperbaric oxygen therapy group. Um, and so I think it's an often forgotten tool. And just because a patient's not being managed in a traditional wound care center for their wound doesn't mean they're not gonna benefit from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So we actually have patients that sometimes someone else is managing their wound. Um, often it's a surgeon who just doesn't want anybody else touching their surgical site, but they could still refer somebody for hyperbaric oxygen therapy and get benefit from that. Um, I always use this as a good opportunity to talk about things that hyperbaric oxygen therapy has indications for, um, because there are some things that you guys treat that I wouldn't necessarily see, um, but it is also good for, because I get this question every now and then. Um, it's good for air and gas emboli, carbon monoxide poisoning, cyanide poisoning, um, decompression sickness, um, central retinal artery occlusion, intracranial abscesses, and then idiopathic sudden sensorial uh, hearing loss. Um, so these are like all things that HBO can be used for. The things that I treat, um, it can be used as an adjunctive therapy for gas gangrene. It is not a replacement for surgical debridement for gas. Um, crash injuries, compartment syndromes, and other acute traumatic ischemias. Um, arterial insufficiencies, like um, enhancement of healing and selected problem wounds is what they call it. Um, there was a patient not that long ago that I saw who had been bitten by a rattlesnake and she did not want to stay for both of her, all of her doses of the antivenom. Um, and then she came in to see me with excruciating pain and skin that was starting to necrose. It was dusky, it looked horrible. Um, we started her for hyperbaric for like 10 dives and um, it completely reversed the process. So if we hadn't done that, hadn't done something about the fact that she had this acute traumatic ischemia from her rattlesnake venom, um, she probably would have ended up with a large wound that would have required surgical debridement and grafting and months of care. And we avoided that completely with just a little bit of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, you can also use it for severe anemia. Um, when I was a resident, we used it for a patient who was a Jehovah's Witness and walked in with a hemoglobin of five. Um, it was enough to keep her kind of alive until she started making some of her own red blood cells. Um, so we did that probably for about two weeks while her red count came back up. She had an acute autoimmune hemolytic anemia, actually. So while we waited for her steroids and her erythropoietin and all of those things to do their job, we used it for that. You can use it for necrotizing soft tissue infections, refractory bone infections, um, delayed radiation injury with necrosis of soft tissue and bone. The most common thing where I did my hyperbaric oxygen therapy rotation as a resident that that facility used it for 
was patients who had prostate cancer and had radiation um, urinary issues. So they had like burning when they peed and issues with retention and just miserable. Um, it worked beautifully for those patients. So like you, somebody may come and see you and six months ago they finished their prostate treatment and they're still having all of these issues with blood on their urine, recurrent UTI is not feeling great. Um, and it, that would be an indication for it. You guys could refer somebody for that if you wanted. Um, compromised grafts and flaps and acute thermal burn injuries are all reasons to use HBL. So um, this is a good example of like what flap failure would look like. So this is a 73 year old male. He's got CAD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, prostate cancer, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, CKD stage 3, and he came in for this little wound on the bottom of his foot. Um, and I squeezed on it, a little bit of pus came out. So in the interest of asking some questions, what would you guys do for this guy as far as workup goes? lab work, physical exam, imaging. Culture of the wound, perfect, love it. He ended up growing in SSA. Would you admit this? If this walked into your office, would you put them on an antibiotic and say, see you in a week? So the answer, vascular studies, love it. Yeah, he got non-invasive vascular studies. They showed microvascular disease, but nothing intervenable otherwise. So for what it's for what it's worth, this guy actually meets the IDSA guidelines for direct admission from clinic. Um, because he's a diabetic with a wound that probes to tendon, but not bone. Um, and he has cellulitic streaking greater than five centimeters from the wound. Um, despite the fact he had a normal white count, he did have a left shift because he doesn't mount the immune response we're looking for. He's afebrile. He doesn't feel bad. But this is actually a, considered a severe diabetic foot infection because of how bad the urethema is, everything else. So sometimes you guys get a phone call from me and it's like, I have no labs, I have no x-rays, but this needs a hospital bed. It's partly because the IDSA guidelines actually have admission criteria that don't always require lab work or imaging to prove someone needs to be in the hospital. And part of that's an experience call because this is what I do all day long. Um, but in part of that's an expedition of care sometimes. So um, this guy actually had huge transportation issues and lived far-ish away. Um, and so for him, it was a situation of like, if I send him home and he has a problem, he's not getting better on antibiotics in 24 hours, like he's gonna be like back here, having to make the trip back and forth, didn't have a ride. So sometimes it's, if they're borderline, like geographic distance makes a difference in how you make that call. Um, so we identified an abscess and it was actually from his big toe interphalangeal joint to just proximal to that small wound, which was sub 
um, his metatarsal cuneiform joint. It was huge, despite that he had just that little hole. He had a staged incision and drainage with hallux amputation, hallux fillet flap. We did a graft and I applied an incisional wound vac. Um, he has wound vac failure. He doesn't do anything with it. It dehisses. So he shows up in my office. This is what he looks like week one. And this is what he looks like week two. And now I'm staring at his metatarsal. It's horrible, but not insurmountable. Now, is this something that you would direct admit from clinic? Let's say he didn't come back into my office. So he came back into the into see his primary care doctor and they said, I want to take a look at this foot. This doesn't need admitted. This needs seen by the specialist within a day or two, though, would be the answer to that question. Yeah, call the surgeon. Absolutely, please. Um, so he did really well. He ultimately got to hear in 20 dives. So that's actually pretty good. Um, and then he passed away. Um, nutrition, I'm not, I'm going to kind of breeze through this in the interest of time, um, but it talks about hemoglobin A1C less than eight, all of those good things. Um, depression and wounds, I always touch on this a little bit because you guys manage depression a lot more than I do. 39% um, of patients who have a chronic wound have uncontrolled depression, and it's part of the reason we can't get them to do the things that we need them to do. So if you're not addressing their depression and or their anxiety, you will never get their wound to heal. Um, and so sometimes you guys will get a phone call or a message in Cerner from me and it's like, hey, I'm seeing this patient and they cry in my office every time I see them. I need help managing their depression here. Um, depression is has significantly higher rates depending on how long patients have been diabetic, whether or not they use insulin, history of acute cardiac events, recent foot surgery and prior wounds. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about is like urgency versus emergency. So some things need handled like tomorrow or within a couple of days. And some things like I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning, I want a phone call. Um, so we're going to run through a list real quick. And we're going to talk about things that are an urgent versus an emergent phone call. So if you have an abscess in a foot, but no gas, is that a call the doctor at one o'clock in the morning problem? Is that a see ya in the office in a week problem? How quickly would you wanna have follow up on an abscess, do you think? Within 24 hours, good answer. Unless the patient is systemically ill, like if they're actively crumping, that's a like now problem actually. So as long as they're hemodynamically stable, 24 hours is perfect. If they're not hemodynamically stable, 24 hours is not okay. Um, what if there's gas in conjunction with the abscess? Does that change the urgency on it? Yeah, so if there is gas, that is an I don't care if it's one o'clock in the morning, call me moment. Um, what about worsening of infection? Like this patient's getting worse, the redness is spreading, there's not really an abscess, you get appropriate like bedside ultrasound or MRI or CT scan with contrast, um, but they're starting to become hemodynamically unstable. Is that a call me now problem? Is that a call me tomorrow problem?
The answer to that question is hemodynamically unstable patient always requires a phone call to the, the specialist. Um, because often if you guys are losing the battle with antibiotics and those kinds of things, sorry, excuse me. Um, if you guys are losing the battle with IV antibiotics, fluid resuscitation, all of that jazz, they probably need an OR in order to get ahead of whatever's causing the problem. Um, what about an Achilles tendon rupture? How quickly should I see that? Soon. Yeah, so um, Achilles tendon ruptures can happen for lots of reasons. Um, in an ideal world, I'd see it within 48 hours. Um, with plan for surgical intervention within the week. Um, compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome. Um, how quickly should, if you have a concern for compartment syndrome, you contact a consulting service who's gonna do surgery on this patient? Now, does anybody know how to test for compartment syndrome? So, oh yeah. Yeah, well, Sarah, I just wanted to tell you that we are at time. Oh, um, sorry. So, yep. uh, um, that's my hand there. Okay, yep. All right. Cool, anybody have any questions for me before we boogie? Thanks for the excellent presentation, Sarah. And you said that uh, residents and physicians can follow or come see you in, uh, how about PA and yeah. your practitioners? Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I, I, I accept all comers. Okay, great. So thanks for the excellent uh, talk. It was uh, great. A lot of great information on uh, wound care and podiatry. And um, I guess if anybody has any questions, they can give you a call, Sarah? That sounds great. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. And Jeannie and Riverstone crew, um, that uh, we have opened that up also to um, nursing staff um, mm -hmm. that need to have some observations. We can do some uh, no hands-on observations, which it makes it very, very nice to be able to come up and maybe see some of the different uh, types of treatments and um, dressings and different things that can be done. And we're happy to help with that. If you just, um, you can give me a call and I will connect you with the right folks. Okay, great. Thanks, Joan. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sample Evinger. And yeah. I love the Muppets and I love your um your ringtones. <laughs> Sorry. This is the call phone. <laughs> All right. Thanks All right. everyone. You have a great day. Thanks. You guys too. <laughs>